Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari. This is the Great Big History Podcast, and this is History 102, American Liberalism from 1945 to 1965. America after World War II is awesome. It's clearly the richest country in the world. It possessed 61% of the world's manufacturing. It was double the Soviet Union's gross national product. It was seven times larger than the UK, which was the 19th century largest economy by far. America actually got richer during World War II, where every other major country got much, much poorer. Growth was about 15% a year. To put that into perspective, growth for the United States since 1965 is usually around 3%. COVID numbers have messed that up a little bit, but it's usually around 3% a year. It had 66% of the world's gold supply so that you can make a movie, you can make a James Bond movie about Goldfinger stealing the world's gold supply by just going after Fort Knox. It had the only atomic weapons. It had 20 million men under arms in 1945, which was not seen by a democratic state since the Romans this kind of massive percentage of the population willingly going under arms. It had the world's only Navy of any note. It was the leader of the world morally after the Nuremberg trials, in which we basically invented the concept of, of war crimes and crimes against humanity and human rights. We invented the UN and came out as anti-colonial, though... That's a, especially in regards to the French, a little iffy. So we are a leader of the world morally and democratically. Though I have but democratically, but it's and democratically. The United States spent money and time and energy to rebuild Japan and Germany into multi-party representative democracies. If you want to know why boomers want to go back to the 50s of their childhood, this is why. What was so great about America? This was so great about America. It was wealthy. The people were wealthy, though we it's complicated. Remember, in history, we always say it's complicated. So, but for... Middle class white boomers, life was good, which is why they want to go back to it. The world was also getting younger. There was a baby boom in the world. You could see this on this graph because of the Great Depression, because of World War II, babies, people having babies declined by a lot. Well, after there was this explosion of wanting to be an adult, of wanting to start over, of wanting to have a family, of getting out of the depression, of getting out of the war, of all this pent up and energy. The marriage age for women dropped in America to around 18 to 20 years of age and around, you know, 22 for men, 20 to 22, depending, you know, it's, it's lower in the South, it's higher in the Northeast, but we're talking today a marriage age of around 30, whereas in 1950, it's around 20, a decade earlier. So that more time means more babies. And you have this explosion of, of youth in America. And so with it, you need space. And so what happens is the suburbs, the gobbling up of farms, farmland, near cities to turn into homes, single family, nuclear family homes. Well, that requires, the work is still in the cities, so that requires highways, cars, the middle class American dream, a home, a house, a car, a backyard, a grill, And so house and property equaled wealth. The car equaled independence and mobility. You had community. 
See, for all the books like Bowling Alone that talk about how bad the suburbs are, if you look at the shows of the 50s, there's a lot of community. There's a lot of creativity. The idea that the, the suburbs are this, this deceptive waste of creativity is a 70s, 80s idea, not a 50s idea. In the 50s, you had your Elks Club. Take a look at, at the Flintstones. You had your Buffalo groups. You had your bowling groups. You had your 4-H's. You had your Boy Scouts and your Girl Scouts for your kids. But you had all of these community groups. You had churches. You had clubs that you could join. So you weren't in the suburbs locked in your house alone with just your family slowly going insane from boredom watching the TV. No, in the 40s, the 50s, and 60s, there's lots to do in the suburbs. Way more to do than in the cities. So, and increasingly, this college for middle-class men, especially men who had been in the war, and so there's the GI Bill, which would pay you to go to college. And there was vocational schools for women, for working-class women. Now, there was college for women, university education for women. This is going to be Betty Friedan's and the second wave feminism we'll talk about later. Um, but that's not most women at this point. But what was opening up was vocational schools, nursing schools, dental hygiene schools, schools that or programs in universities that allowed women to get trade skills that they can then make an independent life or at least, if not independent, contribute to the family income. Now, take a look at the images I have on the screen. Except for the Lion Estates, and if you know, you know, live in the home of tomorrow, today, Lion Estates, which is from Back to the Future. If you knew that, congratulations. The others are all from Norman Rockwell, the family on their way for a weekend of vacation in the car and there's dad driving and he's got a cigar and there's mom in the passenger seat you know her kerchief over her hair to keep it to keep the wind from blowing it there's the boy and his dog there's his sister with bubble gum there's another brother in the back with grandma the extended family on their way for a boating trip because a boat on the top of the car they have a car they've got a little canoe there's three kids there's grandma there's dad right and our next is mom and dad a young mom and dad you know looking at their son now their mom and dad are all dressed up he's in his jacket and tie she's in an evening gown i don't she's not in a gown but she's in a dress and the son is asleep with his dog. They're all cuddled up together. And the third is the famous Norman Rockwell of the runaway. There's a young boy, maybe about 10, 8 to 10 years old. He's got his knapsack and he's in a diner sitting next to a cop. And in front of them is the, um, the cook, soda jockey, you know, host of the diner and they're all having a little talk like this is not that everything is white right except for the seats that are that are these little green um upholstery but the they're having a, a conversation why would you want to run away son so it's it's the soda it's the soda um diner owner who cares about the boy. It's the cop who cares about the boy. And the boy is there, you know, with, with elders who care about him. And then finally, and our last is university, is college, is a young man who um, is a recurring character throughout the war. There's like 17 covers that Norman Rockwell does of him. And this is the last one. Um, it starts from before the war and it goes through his recruitment and it goes through all kinds of 
uh, his story of the war. And it ends with him sitting on a little ledge in a window at university during the fall reading. He's got a pipe, a young man with a pipe, reading his textbooks. And he's got, and I, I wrote to the archivist at the Norman Rockwell Museum to get, get, you know, what was, what would have books, you know, and there's a chemistry book, she said, and there's an engineering book and there's a, a Greek classics book, or at least those are also in the, um, um, photos. She also looked up the photos. The reference photos. So the idea of that is there's a wide range of knowledge that's being opened up to young people. You know, it's not just the wealthy going to university anymore. But what you should also notice about all of these photos, all these images, is that they're white people. There's a white family in the Lion Estates. It's a white family going on vacation. It's a white family with the dog. It's a it's in the diner, the cop, the kid, and the host are all white. And finally, our our college university V uh, veteran is also white. So the representation of the suburban world is a white world. And we'll talk about that as we go through it. So as we just talked about, Norman Rockwell in the Saturday Evening Post becomes the vision of this white, rural, suburban America. And when you think of America in, say, 1950, you are thinking of Norman Rockwell. The images in your mind are Norman Rockwell images. They just are. Or they're happy days. There's images from the 1970s. American Graffiti is a similar movie. It's images of the 1970s reflecting on the 1950s, remembering the 1950s. It's like Grease. Again, a musical of the 1970s reflecting on the 1950s. So your images are of this America of Norman Rockwell. And what is it? It's indulgent of youth. It likes young people. The older folk look at young people and go, hey, it's nice to be young. Why? Because in their youth, they had a depression and they had a war. And so in our first image on our new page, we have the prom. There's a young girl. They're going to a cotillion or a prom. It's a young teenage girl in her white dress with her, with her flower. And she's showing off the flower to, to the diner host. And there's a young man in his white dinner jacket holding her her cardigan and he's all happy because he, she's having a good time and there's a there's a working working dude having his coffee and a cigarette on the left sitting watching this and he's not like oh these young kids stink they suck oh youth today huh get a job no he's got a smile on his face this the 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 diner host cook waiter it's smelling the rose, they're smelling the flower, you know? So they've had a conversation where she's like, would you, oh, well, that's a nice flower. Well, would you like to smell it? Well, I would. That's indulgent of youth. That's indulgent of, of being young. It was safe. It was communal. It was busy and tiring. It's not that people didn't work, but it was good work. And so here's our our next picture of the, the this teacher. I think she's a teacher. She could just be a mom, but there's toys and she's got her planner and it's full and she's exhausted at the end of the day and she's just collapsed onto a small seat. That's why I think of her as an elementary school teacher of just being exhausted. And right next to it is the babysitter. A 10-year-old, 12-year-old girl 
who's t- trying to take care of baby. She's got the book. She's got toys for the baby. The baby is screaming. She's obviously frazzled. You can see with the hair. The the baby has has one of her her pigtails and is pulling on a pigtail. And she's reading the how to be a good how to be a good babysitter book. So she's she's trying to get knowledge. And obviously the things that are there aren't working. So it's tiring work, but she's trying hard to be good at it. There's also generational improvement through education. This is Gillis, who is our our character who went through the war, who had an engineering, chemistry, and Greek classics books. But it's also the image of the farmer, the rancher, in his in his jeans sitting next to his son who's about to get on the train to go to university to go back to university or go to university and it's the son in a suit in business wear in urban business wear he is leaving his home now we say he's going to university because on his bag is a university banner So he is leaving his home. He's not going to be what his father is. He's going to be different from his father. It's generational improvement. Now, the son is all expectant. He's happy. He's looking one way. The father, hunched over, cigarette, is looking the other way. So they're not together. They're not. One is looking maybe into the future. The other is looking into the past. This is not a happy moment. But the idea is that it's an improvement. The society and all of our Norman Rockwell paintings are all wealthy, but they're not rich. It's more equitable. They're rich, but not too rich. The poor are not too poor. It's that everyone had access is the idea to the university, to the prom and cotillion, to the vacation, to the improvement, to the puppies, that you could have it. There is no representation anywhere in here of a billionaire, of a super rich guy. nor is a representation of the poor, the homeless, nor again in our eight photos or eight pictures, eight paintings. Are there people of color? The darkest skin tones you get are from the two working men, the farmer and I think he's got a leather bomber jacket. I think he's a truck driver, but that's, you know, like a cab driver. But that's me. I don't I don't know and I don't have a big enough image to really examine it. But guy, these are men who have been in the sun. That's the darkest skin tone you get. These are not Hispanic men, field hands. They're not African Americans. They're not immigrants. This is a world of the white rural suburban America. So that's Norman Rockwell, but television created the same standards for middle class values. It's a white middle class and rich men matter, especially if it's dad. So you get movies like you get TV shows like Father Knows Best, Ozzy and Harriet, you know, Ozzy and Harriet are the parents. Leave it to Beaver. Well, it's okay. That's the Beaver and his older brother. But also the parents who solve the problems, the Flintstones. The Flintstones are not about the kids. In fact, the kids don't come along till later, I think. I'd have to watch again. But it's two married families. It's the friendship between Fred and Barney and their wives. And since they're they're based on the honeymooners and the honeymooners don't have any kids in them, 
it makes sense that the kids don't come along till later. But I could be wrong. I don't remember. I don't know my Flintstones history. But there's I Love Lucy. That's a show where the baby comes along later. It's again, I Love Lucy. It's about the two adults. And how Lucy gets into problems and Ricky helps solve them. Family matters. Problems are easily solved. And the morality of these television shows, of all these television shows, is an old school Christianity without the Jesus. Be kind to each other. Love thy neighbor. Work hard. Sacrifice. Give. Help. Be charitable. That uh, They're considered Christian values. They're not. They're, they're human values. Every culture has them. Every culture... Um, has charity but in america in 1950 you're talking about the this idea of this christianity but without the jesus none of these shows are going to mention overtly too much jesus even if the characters go to church it's not a major part of the show so it's kind of a universal america is christian but without mentioning the jesus part In this period from 45 to 65, we invent adolescence. The idea that teenagers are different, that they're not young adults. This was a new idea. And it's it, it starts in its earliest, for, for richer folk, earlier. But the idea was that teenagers were, were supposed to be young men. They were supposed to be men. They were supposed to be working or getting ready for their jobs so they were actively uh, apprenticed or they were actively doing a job so how do we get that 16 year old kids are kids and not adults anymore now, now remember you may go oh well, of course they're kids but in our legal system 13 year olds can be tried as adults they could be considered adults for crimes. They are not considered by the law an adolescent. And yet, I'll tell you, if your experience is anything like mine, you grew up in the 70s, 80s, 90s, or 2000s, and as a teenager, no one took you seriously. No one said, you're a man, you're, you're a woman, you're, you're an adult. Nobody. I mean, you can't even rent a car till you're 25. So how do we turn teenagers into like older children well the idea was they needed an education they couldn't start their lives they couldn't go to work anymore because they needed an education in order to defeat the soviets the cold war and new industries demanded more education so what happened was massive government invent investment in public education, free high school, near free community college for vocational or local work. The idea of the community college, which I teach at, but it was the idea that to train people for the local community, to do the jobs of the local community. And so it was available to everybody because the people who were going there were supposed to stay. So you had vocational work. We we have we have a hundred different programs at at at, at Canham County College, a hundred different certificate programs, all for professions. So when people are like, uh, it drives me nuts when people are like, not everybody needs a college education. I'm like, what do you think we do? Well, they should go to a trade school. What do you think we do? Like you don't know what your community college does. You want to learn how to fix air conditioners? We do that. You want to fix cars? We do that. You want to fix your eyes? We do that. Like there's this idea that university is all Greek philosophy. And it's like you come to the community college. We do it all. We do Greek philosophy all the way down. And it's not down. It's just a cross. It's just different. We do dental hygiene. 
We do nursing. We do everything. Because the idea of the community college was that these are people who are going to work in the local, local industries. So the community college was supposed to train teachers because those teachers were then going to work in the local high schools and local elementary schools. They weren't going to move to California or Chicago. They were going to stay in the county. They were going to stay in the community. Well, you had to train those people. And since those people were going to do work for the, com for the county, for the community, it made sense to invest in them. Because you got it back in their work, in their industry. This cheap state-level university education for advanced learning. So the bigger, you know, states, University of Michigan, for example, University of Nebraska, especially in the Midwest, you get these massive, or Pennsylvania, Penn State, the massive university, state university that can suck up 100,000 people. That was also the place for your, your advanced degrees, where you got your PhDs, you did your stuff that you would go work for the government for, or you would go work for labs for, that you were going to leave. You might stay in state, but you were going to leave your community. You were going to move. You're going to go to Pittsburgh. You were going to go to Philadelphia. You might go to Washington, D.C. or New York. All of this education meant that teens had time on their hands. Because all they had was school. Maybe a job, right? Teens have always worked. You know, but that job wasn't a full-time job. It wasn't, it's minimum wage work. And you know it, you know, it's your summer job. So teens have all this time on their hands. So what do you get? You get dating, you get sex, you get drugs, you get car culture, you get spring break. The whole idea of spring break is invented. The idea that during college you stop, you know, you used to stop to do the harvest. You used to stop to go do the farm work in the spring. Now you stop and you go to Fort Lauderdale and you do sex and drugs and dating and car culture and music and magazines. And all of this, of course, leads to adult panic. And we'll see this over and over and over again, that adults freak out that their, their kids, one, have too much time on their hand, two, are not serious enough, and three, getting into trouble. And so what happens is this new morality that girls become responsible for chastity. It's girls' responsibility for staying a virgin. It's girls' responsibility for making sure the boys are a virgin. But boys will be boys. It's the naughty fun. It's they, they do pranks and hijinks, and they try to get the sex. So that's Animal House. We see this in movies all the time. Uh, 1975 through you know 2000. We see this in movies all over the place. From Animal House through um, Porky's and Meatballs and um, all the way through um, American Pie. The idea is virginity was something of a burden for boys that they needed to get rid of, but they had to find a girl willing to... to to, to unburden them of their virginity. That sex was a girl's possession. It was a girl's responsibility. So no means no, but it was always, and this is how I was taught as a Gen Xer in the 70s and 80s, it's a girl who says no. It's not the boy who says no. The boy is supposed to want the sex, the drugs, the adventure. The idea that a girl would want that stuff was, was insane. It was, just, it was just insane. It was insane. It was, it was not a concept. And that's how we were taught. So we'll talk about this when we deal with feminism. But as you're, you're talking about an entire generation of people who were taught that, and then AIDS happened in my, in my youth, AIDS happened. And that was just the end of, that was the, the end of things, you know, AIDS meant all sex could kill you. So, but right now girls could get pregnant. 
a boy got a girl pregnant. You, you see it in the, in the phrasing, you see it in the words, a boy gets a girl pregnant. The girl was responsible for chastity, for saying no. But boys, boys will be boys, you know, hey, it's naughty fun. Animal House is all about going to college, not for the academics, but for the fun, the sex, the drugs, the music. And so adults panic about this because they're worried about their kids. And we'll see this panic happen again and again and again. We'll see it again in the 80s. We'll see it again in the 70s. Well, no, actually, in the 70s, we kind of get a little, little less panic. In the 80s, we get panic again. And we get the 90s, we get the helicopter parents and the overscheduled kids. <sighs> so problems. Problems with the American dream. Well, the problems with America in 1945, 1965, is, as we've you've kind of already seen the theme, right? The American dream is not shared equally. It is overwhelmingly white, male, straight, and industrial educated work. Farming has lost out. You, you go, well, why is it industrial and educated? Because farming has lost out. Services have lost out. You know, it is not a privilege to be a bell, um, bellhop, a, you know, uh, a waiter that becomes women's work, um, a hotel runner. I don't know what the, what the word is, a hotelier, but the, it's okay to open the hotel and run the hotel, but not be the maitre d' of the hotel, like in, um, the Wes Anderson Grand Budapest Hotel. To be the main character in the Grand Budapest Hotel becomes not something you be you do in America. It that becomes low wage work, female work. Um, but industrial work, whether you're making cars or planes or missiles, I mean, this is a time of the, the space race and the arms race, uh, or educated. This is where doctors become quote doctors. You know, doctor means teacher, but now a doctor becomes a real doctor. So you get people who tell me, oh, you're a PhD, but you shouldn't have, a, you shouldn't be called doctor. Doctors are medical doctors. And I'm like, you, do you know that in how many presidents have been killed by their own doctors? You know, so, but this is where it becomes educated work. You had to have an advanced degree to become a surgeon a medical doctor. And so that becomes elevated. Two, black folk had Jim Crow segregation and legal terrorism in the South. So they were not allowed to have better jobs, a better education, a better life, nor demand it because they couldn't vote. But there was also economic and social segregation in the North. So it was not like, oh, outside of Jim Crow segregation, the black life was a better, more integrated one. No, it wasn't either. Three, women had the right to vote, but no access to economic equality. And thus, since they weren't going to get the jobs that demanded that were the same as the men, they didn't have the economic equality of men. Thus, there was not considered the need, the need to have educational equality. The idea was colleges and jobs were to be done to find a better husband. You went to college to find a better husband, to marry a doctor, who would then take care of you, to network for women, not to get the degree itself. And so men had to have the better educational access because they had to get the job in order to take care of their wives and their kids. Four. Oh, and if you want that, my mother has a story. My mother has a story that she took a math class in the sixties at, at college. And there were two or three girls in the class and the teacher got up and said, ladies, there is no reason for you to be here. 
you can take the class, but there's no point in you being here. And no woman has ever passed my class. And he essentially kicked them out. He essentially kicked them out of, out of their math class. Could you imagine doing that? I can't, I can't fathom the idea of doing that in my class. First of all, in my history classes, at least half the population is now female, if not more. But that was not only considered routine because he did it, it was acceptable because all three women quit the class. I said, well, maybe that he's right. I can't pass the class anyway. Maybe I don't need it. Maybe this job, maybe, maybe being a mathematician isn't for me. And so your world got smaller because you didn't have access. You didn't have the educational equality. And finally, four is gay people didn't even exist. Except there's no gay lifestyle where people are out and together and and outside of isolated vacation places like Cherry Grove, Long, uh, Long Island, Fire Island, or Provincetown, Cape Cod, there's you couldn't be out in the suburbs living with your husband, living with your wife. Homosexuals were sick. Legally, psychology called it a disease until the 1970s. Now, that's considered an improvement. You may go, oh, that's terrible, but that was considered an improvement because before that, it was crime. Sick can be cured. Before the 1940s, it was a, 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 a crime against nature. You went to jail for it. This is why we still have the, the, the association that homosexuals and pedophiles are the same thing. Even now in, in the 2020s, there, there's no connection. There's none, no connection whatsoever. But it goes back a hundred years. But psychology called it a disease into the 1970s. And the idea where homosexuals were, were just outside of society. They were probably commies, liberals, pinkos, perhaps kid touchers. They're not masculine at all. The idea that a man would have sex with, with another man was just not masculine. And that homosexuality was seen as a massive failure of society, not just of the person, but also of mothers and fathers. How did you get that way? How did you raise a homosexual son? Now, homosexual women don't exist at all. They're completely off the radar, which actually gave lesbians a bit more freedom. They could have their best friend, who's another woman, and live together. Why? Because it because you so needed a man to get ahead in America in 1950 that the only other way was that you created a female group, coven, basically that relied on each other. So you lived with roommates, you lived with housemates, you relied on each other. So there was this way that women could be lesbians without the world knowing that they were lesbians. They just hadn't met the right man yet. And then women got to a certain age and it was like, well, you know, you're 25, who's gonna wanna marry you now? And then you're 35 and there's no, I mean, you know, you're a spinster. You know, your time has, your time has passed. No one's going to marry you now. You're too old. And so, you know, so people went, oh, well, of course you'd live. You know, think of the Golden Girls. Why is the Golden Girls of the 1980s such a gay icon show? What's four women living together? Three women of the same age and their mom and one's mom. They are, they are living a homosocial lifestyle. 
that you couldn't get even in the 1980s anywhere, represented anywhere. But it's acceptable for women, though there are shows also in the 80s that do have have male roommates. I'm thinking of Perfect Strangers as one. But notice how many episodes are about like like The Odd Couple. The Odd Couple also has the the idea that they are heterosexual men. Oscar is interested in, in the Bird Sisters. You know, they have a date at the end of that play. It's it's why it's the problem with making with the desire, the need for lots of people to make Bert and Ernie homosexual, and like they're just not. They're just good friends, best friends who live together. Because living on Sesame Street's expensive, man. And it was the odd, they're the odd couple. They're two divorcees. They don't have women in their lives. And so it's expensive. So they live in the same place. They, they, you know. So, but, you know, but there's this, 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 this desire because you just don't see that accepted anywhere. So, of course, Bern and Ernie are secretly gay. But notice that in even Avenue Q, which has a Bert and Ernie character, Bert is gay in Avenue Q. The Bert character is gay, but Ernie isn't. And they're not with each other. Now, part of the play is that Bert comes out and accepts that he's gay and in the end gets a boyfriend. So the but. That's the early 2000s where you can come, start to come out. And we'll talk about this. But homosexuality was seen as a massive failure. It's mothers being too mothering. It's fathers being too weak. It's society in general. Now, here's the kicker. Here's the kicker of all that. In the Kinsey sexual health studies, in the 1948 study, the first one of its, the first one where they, they asked these questionnaires, 37% of men and 13% of women had had a homosexual experience. 37%. That tells you what happened on all those Navy ships during the war. When there weren't women around. So here's the thing. The 1950s is considered so anti-gay that gayness is a sickness. There's a plot line in in Mad Men about it. And and I have seen people be like, uh, well, there's the 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 he's gay, but he's closeted. He's married. And he's working in the arts and fashion, right? So it's a it's a place where he's cons- allowed to be eccentric, quote unquote. You know, he's in he's allowed to be into fashion because it's part of his job. Right. But he's married. But when the main character, when Don Draper finds out that he's he's gay, he fires him. And I've seen forum posts and discussions be like, well, what happens to this character? And well, what happens to the character is is the character does exactly what he says he's going to do. He disappears into the gay life of New York, of Central Park. He becomes, quote unquote, a pervert. Because it's we're a decade away from any kind of liberation. And there's just no place for him to be out and accepted. And so the show is very clear on what happens to him. And it's not a happy story. Because it wasn't a happy story. But the kicker of that is nearly 40% of men, adult men, by this study had had a homosexual experience. So the 50s were way more gay, way more gay than it thought it was. And was terrified that it actually had been. So 
So what are the answers? The answers are civil rights, but never in one way. There are many ways, especially for African-American civil rights. There's Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP, and that was legal. There's a legal path to equality. The laws must change. And they, this is the biggest win is Brown versus the Board of Ed. The idea that the 14th Amendment, the laws must treat everyone equally, regardless of color. And Thurgood Marshall's idea, and he will become a Supreme Court justice, is we have to work within the system. You have to use white people's laws in order to get black rights. That's what you're just going to have to do. You're going to have to look, look white people in the face and say, you're not abiding by your own laws. Now, here's the thing about Brown versus Board of Ed. It said segregation is wrong. Schools must be integrated. Brown versus Board of Ed. Schools don't become integrated overnight. In fact, it's decades before they become integrated, if they become integrated at all. The second is second means is Martin Luther King Jr. The mass movement, the nonviolent abuse. See, nonviolence is the idea that, oh, you protest without doing violence. But it's also, and this is the Gandhi notion, is you accept the abuse you get. You accept being hit by water cannons, by dogs, by, by being a beaten. You accept that you do not respond. And that gives you a moral high ground. But Martin Luther King is constantly arrested. In fact, his most famous book is Letters from a Birmingham Jail. He's a troublemaker. He wants to show that the laws are bad. Which makes sense that he's a preacher. Because that's very much Jesus. Jesus is constantly getting into fights with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And they say, you're not following the law. And he's like, well, it's a bad law. How is helping somebody on the Sabbath bad? How is doing something good bad because of what day it's on? And so it makes sense that Martin Luther King is a preacher. He's using the same moral framework. The idea that we can work within the system, but we need to show its flaws. Then there's Malcolm X, which is a version of non-Christian black masculinity. Now, Malcolm X comes out of the separatist school, the Marcus Garvey school. If you want a more, more modern version, it's kind of Killer Mike and his show on Netflix. The idea of the black dollar, the black industry, that black folk need to support other black folk economically and socially. And it's the idea that black folk need to be independent of white America and its institutions, its banks, its businesses, its corporations. Black folk can connect to a wider world of people of color. One of the major innovations of Malcolm X, Alex Haley, of Marcus Garvey, is the idea that black folk are stuck in America, but there is a whole nother world of black folk who are successful, wealthy, independent, that you could connect to. And this is the very famous piece in the autobiography for Malcolm X of the Hajj. If you want a more modern, it's still from the 70s, but it's it's the um the Richard Pryor going to Africa. Dave Chappelle has one of uh, has a a going to Africa um bit in his stage work as well. The idea of going and connecting to other people of color. So for Malcolm X, it's going on Hajj, going to Mecca, and seeing all these other Muslims, seeing all these people who are not white, who are all of color, who are African. And Middle Eastern and European. All of these people. And the idea is that we can have our own system. And we can especially have a black masculinity that's separate from the white definition. 
So again, if you read the work of Malcolm X, if you if you listen, some of it is the idea that black men have fallen into the stereotype that white people have created, that black men are lazy, that black men are are not responsible, that black men are bad fathers, black men don't take care of their kids, all of that, that that's, that's not black. It's a white definition of black masculinity and that black men could define themselves. And so if you watch, say, Malcolm X, the movie, which is done by Spike, Spike Lee, it's about control and about being like they're all in the suit with the skinny tie and being being well dressed and well read and well behaved and and responsible but in in air in controlled right disciplined discipline is the word rather than control i'm looking for but it's the idea that it's discipline of oneself but it's also the improvement of oneself as well which is which is why i think and you know i am a middle class white man but i think that's the appeal of malcolm x the idea of so and it's a very american idea it's the idea of self-improvement that you can do it for yourself and that and the important part of of this and is that you could connect to others you're not alone there are, uh, there's a whole world there's a whole america full of black men see when when this is the the million Man March back in the 90s, I think. I lived through it. I remember it happening. But it was black men going on a march through Washington, D.C., and it was supposed to be the Million Man March. Um, and then you saw the white institutions go, well, did a million men really show up? All these white newscasters are like, we don't think a million people actually showed up. You know, it, it's the, but it didn't matter. It's the idea of the Million Man March that you could put a million black men together. And they could say, we're going to be better men. We're going to be better fathers. We're going to be better people. And we're going to help each other, which is the most important part. And then there's Stokely, Stokely, Stokely Carmichael, who represented SNCC. The student and the youth and the anger that things aren't changing. These are the guys who got beaten. When Martin Luther King Jr. came in, gave his speech, Got did did the whole thing, and when he left, the cameras left, and Stokey Carmichael and the students were left. And these are the kids that got beaten. These are the kids that got arrested. These are the kids that got terrorized. And so by 68, 69, especially after the death of Martin Luther King, the assassination, I should say, of Martin Luther King, they're anger that things aren't changing. And so this is black power, the, the clenched fist, the, the socialist clenched fist. You know, after 68, the Black Panthers, the idea of self-defense, the international. You know, this is this is this is um Mexico and the, the two Olympians who raise their fist for black power. That's this tradition, the language of early rap, of do the right thing, of fight the power. The idea for Stokely Carmichael was the system is broken and we have to break it in order to build a new, more egalitarian system. That the system isn't working for us. So the, so the idea that you could live separately, the Malcolm X, is they're not going to let us. They're not going to let us have a separate banking system, a separate industry system, a separate educational system. They're not going to let us. And the idea that Thurgood Marshall or Martin Luther King is that you could work within the system is that the system is broken. You're trying to fix something that can't be fixed. So what do you have to do? You have to break it. You have to smash it. You have to French Revolution it. You have to Russian Revolution it. And then build a more egalitarian system. This problems as we get into the 60s of civil rights affects even norman rockwell himself in the 60s he leaves the saturday evening post and goes to look magazine 
and does things like the problem we all live with, which is Ruby Bridges being escorted by into an all-white school 20 years after Brown versus Board of Ed, and she has to be escorted by federal police officers. And she has had tomatoes thrown at her. She has had curse words written on the wall about her. And she is defiantly wanting to go to school that she is allowed to. And this is 20 years after the board of board Brown versus board of education. This is right to know, which is a multi-generational, multi-diverse racial, multi-gender group looking at what is essentially the president's seat asking about Vietnam. They have a right to know about Vietnam. They're all citizens. There's new kids in the neighborhood about integration. And the idea is, from Norman Rockwell's idea is, here is the moment where the two cultures are meeting. And you're not sure how it's going to turn out. And Chicago is famously bad at integration. This is going to be a raisin in the sun, the play about integration. Famously bad about it so you have the young black kids the girl in her dress holding her cat the boy in his shorts holding his his glove his baseball glove and what do you have on the other side you have three white kids two boys and a girl and a little dog the boys have baseball a glove another boy is dressed in his baseball uniform and for Norman Rockwell in the archives, they say that Norman Rockwell, these kids are going to play with each other. These kids are going to be friends. This is the moment where they're meeting the strangers in the new town. But they will be friends. They have, they have too much in common. The dog will chase the cat, right? The kids, the boys will play baseball. The girls will get along. But in the back, in a window is an old lady looking out the window watching her neighborhood change. And it's that woman who's the problem. Will she allow the new African Americans to be in the neighborhood? Or is she going to call the cops on her neighbors if their grass gets too long? Or if they someone parks in the street overnight Is she going to be the problem? The idea is that the kids aren't. See, the, he foregrounds the, the front and say, oh, this is the problem. It's actually not the problem. The problem is barely seen in the back. It's the, it's the thing you don't see. And then there's the murder in Mississippi. And I have the two versions. I have the final version, but I also have the sketch version. Because the sketch version is very important to me. And the reason why is in the final version, the idea was to go, the idea of the Thurgood Marshall, Martin Luther King Jr. idea was, and this is Lyndon Johnson as well, is voting. Get voting. Get voting. If you can vote, you can change. So you have to register to vote. That the federal government will help you, but you have to go and register black folk to vote. And so... And so here we are, and what happened in Mississippi is three men were murdered. And they were mo murdered trying to register black folk to vote. And it's incredibly powerful. And the original sketch shows just how important law officers were to it. So very much a modern hashtag Black Lives Matter. The idea that the law is part of it, is part of the segregation, is part of the terrorism, is part of the oppression. 
Now that part got cut out to make it more ominous so that you see just the shadows of the men staring at the one dead man, the one dying man, and the one man about to be murdered. But in the full sketch, it's neighborhood men in shirts and ties, educated men, and the quote, good old boy cop standing there with his pistol and his gun belt and his cigar about to murder these people being technically an officer of the peace. Now take all of those pictures, all of them of what has happened to Norman Rockwell in the sixties of how, how, how race conscious he's become and compare it to the Saturday evening post cover. He did of the young boy on the train ordering a uh, breakfast. He's getting tea. So I'm going with breakfast. And there's the benevolent, older African-American waiter waiting for him to decide. And it's the boy being like, he's going to have his, he's, he's going to be an adult. He's going to order, but he's going to order a, from a place of privilege. And who's going to be served by? African-American man, an older African-American man who in our indulgence of youth, remember from the beginning of this, this, this lecture is looking on smiling about this young boy growing into his white manhood. That is a completely different version of race than the other four pictures we have. The other four paintings we have of Norman Rockwell of the 19 late 1960s, Norman Rockwell, mid sixties, I shouldn't say even late mid sixties, Norman Rockwell. And let's be honest, the Ruby Bridges painting is one of the most famous paintings in all of Americana uh, of race relations. So Norman Rockwell makes the Americana of the suburbs of the 1940s and 50s, but he also has the ability to make the Americana of the civil rights movement as well. So what are the solutions? For African Americans, it's civil rights protests, mass movement, suffering violence, MLK celebrity. You, you cannot underestimate how important Martin Luther King being famous was because the cameras came to him to highlight things. He was murdered while doing that for unions. So it's the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The idea is to end segregation by law in the U.S. and safeguard democracy for black folk. And the idea is if black folk can vote, they will vote for things that's kind of like the labor movement we talked about in the 1900s. They'll vote for things and people who need to get elected will go to them, will promise them stuff. It will get better. What people did not foresee was a economic resegregation of people of white people just basically saying, I'm not going to live with black people and I'm just going to move away from them. For feminism, it's the birth control pill of 1960, the ability for women to be able to have sex and control their reproductive, control their body to have sex and not get pregnant, to not be, um, to be independent, to be separate from a man, but the, but still engage in the activities of adulthood. There's the Equal Pay Act of 1963 and then Title IX of 1972. The idea that women should have access to economic independence and equity in the college and the workplace. Not equality, but equity. We're not at equality. Now that's going to be the Equal Rights Amendment that's going to fail in the 1980s, but at least the birth control pill, the Equal Rights Act, and Title IX are all about equity, about helping women gain more, become more in line with the same successes as men are having, but not to treat them the same. And for gay liberation, we have the Stonewall Riots, Harvey Milk being elected in San Francisco as an out gay man. We have pride parades. We have the idea that gay people do exist. 
This is the late 60s into the 70s. The song, We're Here, We're Queer, Get Used to It. That being out and coming out became part of this rebirth of identity, which is gut-wrenching. I've had in college, every young gay man I knew in college tried to commit suicide at least once. Everyone. Everyone that I knew, everyone that was a friend of mine tried to commit suicide in college at least once. Before coming out. Before admitting that they were a gay man. And that's the 90s. What must have been like in the 70s in Nebraska? Like, I'm from New York. And it was, this was the trauma gay men were having, young gay men were having. So there's this rebirth of having to announce that you're, you're, you're gay. And there's a pride to that. And there should be a pride to that. But there was also a trauma to that as well of having to do it. I, I, as a heterosexual man, never had to announce to anybody I was heterosexual. In fact, we had the opposite problem. You go on a date with a girl and a father, I've had guns pointed at me by dads in rural New York. You go and not pointed, but they're cleaning their shotgun. You know, they got it cracked open, the double barrel shotgun, they're cleaning it, there's no nothing in it. And, you know, they pick it up and they point it so that they can look through the barrels, make sure it's nice and clean, and that just happens to look through right to you. Oh, hi. Hi, Dad. Of the girl I'm taking on a date, and they're like, hey, you know, make sure my daughter's all right when you come back. So you had you had the terrorism of the older generation and it's all shits and giggles because the guy then went to the bar and he talked about how he scared the shit out of the 16 year old boy and blah, 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 you know, <laughs> you know, and all the other men laughed like, ah, oh, you know, if she, she was my daughter, some boy comes looking around for my daughter, you know, that kind of bullshit, that, that toxic masculinity that you had to deal with in the eighties and the nineties. So we had the opposite problem. You, you didn't have to announce that you were heterosexual. You just got terrorized by older men for being heterosexual because women were a property. Either they wanted, either they were the, the fathers and thus they were protective, quote unquote, or they were, they wanted to date that girl. And so I've, I mean, I've had, when I was a teenager, I had in my early twenties, I got threatened a bunch of times by guys being like, She's mine. I'm like, you're not dating her. Maybe she should decide who she, But the idea was, no, no. So there's this trauma. And really, if you're gay, you can only be in a few places. New York City, San Francisco, LA, London. And only in certain jobs. Fashion, acting, writing. Now, AIDS changed everything by making the invisible visible. But it was a trauma. First of all, it was a, AIDS wiped out a whole generation of gay men. And it was a trauma to get recognized. One needs to watch The Normal Heart. The, the play turned into a movie on HBO to see just how scared all of these men were of being out. Of what could happen. That if you were found out, you could be fired. There's, no prote There's still no protection in most of America that if you're gay, you, you won't be fired for being gay. But all these fights work. America becomes freer, becomes more diverse, becomes more equitable to different lifestyles. Women enter the workforce. They start getting divorces. They have sex. They gain independence. Gay folks start building communities and families of choice in their insular neighborhoods. Like, like literally here in Philly, we have the Gaberhood. In New York, we had the West Village. That... Johnson, in 1964, wins the greatest liberal political victory since 1936. It's still the biggest popular vote victory. And that America is rich in 1964, educated, 
and it's becoming more equitable and more diverse. But, 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 the seeds are there in that map, in those two maps, the county map and especially the electoral map of what will happen over the next decade. That Johnson wins this massive victory, this massive electoral vote victory. It's smashing. He won 61% of the popular vote. And yet he lost South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. And if you go on the county map, he essentially lost every county in Mississippi, most of the counties in Alabama. And the non Atlanta counties, especially in the southwestern part, Of Georgia, all the low country counties in South Carolina. There is a conservative change beginning that is reacting to all of those protests, that is reacting to all of those changes, that is reacting to, to black people gaining more rights, to women uh, moving out of traditional feminist or traditional female roles and to gay people existing out in the world. There's a reaction to the liberalness, to the progressiveness. And you can see it in 64 that's starting and where it will come from. But by 1968, the world is also coming apart. Martin Luther King Jr. will be assassinated. Robert Kennedy will be assassinated. The Vietnam War will spill into the streets of Saigon and become hopeless. That even Walter Cronkite will say this, this war is hopeless. At the Democratic National Convention in 68, you'll get the cops beating the young protesters. So, so much for our indulgent of youth. Now the cops are beating them. We get protests in Prague, a revolution against the Soviet Union in Prague. We get massive revolution, not revolution, but the taking to the streets in Paris. And we get the urban riots throughout all of the country following Martin Luther King's death. Of this frustration that the world isn't changing. So thank you. Be safe.